All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to NWS 101. Thank you so much for joining us today at 7 p.m. Um, just a few logistical things before we jump into the webinar. So this is GoToWebinar. You should see like a little side panel to the right on your screen. Um, and in there, there's a lot of different things to help make this more interactive. So there's a questions area. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation or at the very end, whenever, um, just go ahead and pop that in there. There will be someone that can go through the questions throughout the presentation, and then also we'll get to them at the very end if we haven't been able to get to them yet. Um, there's also a section in the handouts where there's two handouts for this presentation. One of them is the actual presentation itself in PDF format. Um, so everything that we're going to talk about today is already there. If you want to download it, take notes on it, just print it out, have it, save it for later. Everything is hyperlinked in that PDF. So we're going to talk about a lot of different resources and links today, and all of those are hyperlinked in the PDF already. So you can just go in to that PDF and click on the links whenever we're talking about what we're talking about. So that makes it really easy to save those links offhand. The second one is a situational awareness document or weather awareness links, which is a lot of the same links that we're going to talk about today, just condensed into one easy document. This is a really good document to have on hand in a binder, on your desk, um, wherever it's easiest for you to access it. It has information on how to receive warnings and alerts, situational awareness for different weather hazards and where you can find specific weather information, and then finally, um, staying ahead by looking at the forecast. So there's a lot of different resources in there for how you can find your local forecast and what specifically you are looking for. So I encourage you to go in there and download those handouts if you haven't already. We're going to give people a few more minutes to kind of jump in here and uh, get settled before we jump in. Um, but just out of curiosity, I'd kind of like to know where everyone is tuning in from. So if you can go into the chat or the questions box and uh, say what city you're tuning in from or what town, that would be really cool to see. It also helped me know if my audio and webcam are working. Hey, Pittsburgh, Jersey Shore, Carlisle, Belfont, State College, Wilmington. Audio and good, video, good, excellent. York, York, Camp Hill, Ferguson Township, Orange County, Dallas Town, excellent. So many people, thank you so much. For, for telling me where you're coming from. This is exciting. We're in State College. That's where our office is based. So that's where we're tuning in from. All right, someone already asked a question. Will NWS be issuing the new enhanced severe thunderstorm warnings? I'm not sure what you mean by new enhanced. So if you can elaborate a little bit, that would be helpful. And Rachel, I think she may be um pertaining to the tags, the threat tags on them. So like we already do for tornadoes and flash floods, there's gonna be um, basically like considerable and destructive tags around severe thunderstorms. We will be eventually, um, I don't think the date's 100% set and firm yet, but at some point that'll that'll be coming out. Okay, thank you. That's what they're pertaining to. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so good to hear from so many of you. I really appreciate getting to know some of you this way virtually. Um, so I guess I'll just explain a little bit about the motivation behind a talk like this. So um, as you saw, this is the first of a kind. We're doing a Weather Ready Nation lecture series, first ever for spring 2021. And the goal of this is to not only reach out to our Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, and if you're not a Weather Ready Nation ambassador, don't worry, this is not just for you. And if you are a Weather Ready Nation ambassador, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. But the goal of this is to not only reach out to our Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, but to just reach out to the public and get to know you and also just explain what resources you have available to you. Um, the website can be confusing, even to me. <laughs> so there's a lot of different links out there. There's a lot of different information out there. And maybe you're trying to find specific information that you can't get a hold of. And this is why we're we're going to host this event, is to help you know where you can get that information and um, make it easier for you to get information that's important to you. 
Um, so that's why we're doing this. And we will have a series of events coming up, virtually lectures, and um, we will have them about monthly. So this is the first one in February, potentially we'll be having one in March and April and so on for about like four to five lectures. So if you like this, if it's entertaining to you, keep an eye out for the next one. They're gonna be all different information. So we will not be having NWS 101 again for quite some time. Um, so, except for the repeat on Thursday at 11 a.m., if you are interested in attending again. Uh, but we will have different topics that we're covering, like severe weather safety, flood safety and awareness, um, weather ready nation, and other topics like that. So, if that interests you, be on the lookout for more of these events, however you found it today. Just keep an eye out, and we'll be hosting more of these in the future. All right. So, I see. We're kind of at a lull with the participation. So I guess we will go ahead and get started. Um, so we're just gonna do some introductions first. So my name is Rachel Gutierrez. I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service and State College. I'm originally from Chicago, um, but now I live in State College. And I just have a passion for meteorology and emergency management, and I really love outreach. So really happy to be talking with you today. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Gooseman. I'm what's considered or called the Warning Coordination Meteorologist here at the National Weather Service and State College. I'm originally from southeast of Cincinnati, Ohio, so about seven hours away. And uh, same as Rachel, I love uh, the outreach side. It's actually uh, my responsibility to be the liaison between emergency management, media, and yourselves uh, as ambassadors with our office uh, here at State College. So look forward to talking with you this evening. Hi, my name is Miranda Bidding. I'm a senior at the University of Delaware studying meteorology and climatology, and I'll also be going to Penn State next year, but I'm a student volunteer right now at NWS State College. Hi, good evening. My name is Connor Chapman. I'm a graduate student in physical geography and climate science at Penn State University, and I am a student volunteer with the National Weather Service this semester. All right, thanks everyone. And now I will pass it off to Goose. Let me just the mouse control over. All right, thank you. And um, I thought to just to uh, uh, kind of piggyback on the question we were asked about the enhanced uh, severe thunderstorm warnings earlier. So what's going to happen? I believe I looked up the date. It's April 28th is actually what's been set in place. I'm not. You know, that may that may change one way or the other, uh, but essentially what's going to happen is going to be considerable tags and destructive tags put on severe thunderstorm warnings. So considerable would be for 70 mile an hour winds or golf ball size hail, and then the destructive tag would be if you're looking at 80 mile an hour winds or baseball size hail. And those destructive tags, uh, that's actually going to trigger cell phones if uh, if we see those. But fortunately here in central Pennsylvania, it's not a common occurrence. Don't want to be seeing baseballs uh, falling from the sky in 80 mile an hour winds. So just thought I'd, I'd set that out there. Good question earlier on. Uh, so starting off, uh, just kind of talking, giving the uh, prelude of uh, the National Weather Service across the country and then focusing more here on uh, Pennsylvania and State College. Uh, so you can see here we're part of the federal government. Uh, so tax supported, so the taxes you pay support us uh, working here 24-7, 365. And of course, with COVID protocol on that here, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of time working remotely as a, uh, compared to normal. I'm actually in the office here on a shift this evening, so it kind of gives you an idea what part of the office looks like behind me. Um, but uh, you see there, America's weather in enterprise in terms of you know we're, we're the sole ones that issue uh, severe thunderstorm, flash flood, tornado warnings. Uh, most notably here over the recent months, winter storm watches and warnings, uh, winter weather advisories. Uh, so we don't, you know, compete with private sector businesses uh, that are actually working, uh, say, with a, a certain company or maybe a set of individuals to provide forecast to them. Uh, we do provide a, a free forecast all uh, goes out seven days uh, with time. Uh, and that's always available on weather.gov. And then we've got various uh, phone call recordings, social media that uh, also displays those. And uh, getting in on staffing. There's 122 offices across the country, just like ours uh, here in State College. 
And you see kind of the breakdown here, there's uh, 14 uh, meteorologist forecasters. So essentially work, uh, rotating shift work, keeping the 24 7, 365 operations going. So out of that uh, number there, there's five that are considered lead forecasters or lead uh, senior meteorologists. Uh, they're the ones that are responsible for everything that's disseminated on the shift. Uh, if things uh, such as, you know, if someone gets sick on a shift, filling that shift, making sure that there's at least two staff in the office at all times. So they're kind of the ones that are looked up to in leading leading each shift. And then there's a, a range of eight to nine uh, meteorologists, just depending on vacancies and that, that uh, work with the senior forecaster to disseminate again, warnings, watches, and all, uh, all products out there. And there's a number of other duties um, that are thrown in there, such as answering phone calls in, uh, climate reports, getting those uh, sent out and issued, quality controlling data, and then, of course, uh, no weather radio. Uh, we monitor that and, uh, and issue our products and uh, make sure that that's up and functioning on all of our transmitters here uh, across central Pennsylvania and across the whole country, uh, encompassing the whole weather service. And then uh, getting into uh, the more, I guess if you want to call them specialized positions or positions where there's uh, usually just one per office. So we have a uh, the kind of the head of all the training and research type efforts going on in the office, uh, the science and operations officer. And then uh, myself, the morning coordination meteorologist, again, being the liaison between uh, partners such as emergency management, media, uh, transportation, PennDOT, and then, uh, then as well as the public there, your, yourselves and ambassadors uh, back to us here in the office. So I get to do a lot of the outreach and a lot of the fun stuff of getting out of the office uh, when we're able to do that. And then uh, the one that oversees basically all operations and everyone in the office, uh, the meteorologist in charge, so again, they basically take on the responsibility of uh, the, whole, the whole office and everybody in it and then everything going in and out uh, of the uh, weather service office. And then we have uh, what's called an OPAL for short, shorter observing program leader, really focuses on the equipment uh, for our volunteer uh, weather observers that send in uh, temperature and precipitation data every day. Uh, so ours, Aaron, he was just on the road today uh, doing some maintenance on some equipment around the uh, county warning area here. And then we also have a uh, what's called an information technology officer or an ITO. And they do a lot of the uh, kind of the behind the scenes that keeps all of our uh, graphical uh, forecast and uh, warning systems up to date and running. So a lot of troubleshooting in that, in that side of things. And then uh, he works closely with the, the electronic staff. So we've got several electronics technicians and an electronic systems analyst that keeps uh, all systems up and going, uh, such as all the, again, the weather radio transmitters, the radar, our, uh, a lot of our observing equipment. So uh, those guys stay busy uh, keeping everything up and running. So it's not just meteorologists that works here at the office or at any National Weather Service, but it's a, there's a complement of staff that have to work to help the meteorologists keep things up and going to 24-7. Uh, Seven miles, or five miles, this. And uh, looking across the country here, I mentioned the uh, 122 offices. Uh, you see there even uh, Alaska and Hawaii are included. But every different uh, color denotion on this map shows what's called a county warning area. Uh, so a subset of counties that that particular National Weather Service office is responsible for issuing uh, warnings, watches, uh, advisories, and forecasts for. So up here, in, you see in central Pennsylvania, this is ours, uh, State College, and we'll show a zoomed in uh, picture here in a minute. But then we're bordered by uh, Pittsburgh, Sterling, Mount Holly, New Jersey, which is Philadelphia's office, and then uh, Binghamton and Buffalo up in New York. And as you go out across the country here, just like the note, a lot of offices cover a lot greater area than we even do here in State College uh, as you get out west there, so a little less population, especially as you get into the Rockies here in the spine. And then as you get out east, they tend to be a, a little smaller in nature in terms of uh, overall size responsibility there. And the breakdown here across the Commonwealth, you see here uh, in Pennsylvania, the yellow are all the uh, 33 counties that we're responsible for here at uh, State College across the central portion of the state. And we've got four other offices uh, that share a responsibility of the state, and all of them actually um, forecast and warn for other states than Pennsylvania. We're just, in State College, we solely are responsible for uh, counties here in Pennsylvania. So you got Pittsburgh uh, here in the green color. They also go into Ohio and uh, portions of West Virginia. 
And then up in the uh, northwest part of the state, Cleveland, Ohio, actually takes care of uh, Erie and uh, Crawford counties up in northwest Pennsylvania. And then up in the northeast is Binghamton's uh, area of responsibility in northeast Pennsylvania. And then down kind of the east-southeast, uh, Mount Holly, New Jersey, Philadelphia's office. So we work really closely with all five uh, of these offices here. You see us here in State College in our central Pennsylvania hub, essentially right in the middle of uh, our county warning area. So Warren County being the furthest northwest, and then we go down uh, southeast where our population um, interstate hub really picks up down into uh, from Dauphin County to York and Lancaster and Lebanon counties. And then I mentioned our electronics technicians that keep all of our systems up and going. So uh, the image here on the top left is what's uh, called ASOS for sure, short, an ASOS system or an automated surface observing system. So it takes readings uh, such as temperature, uh, dew point, wind, pressure, uh, precipitation. Uh, so there's a, uh, you know, these are usually located at airports. Uh, our main two that we do uh, long term climate record data for or, uh, up in Williamsport and then down in uh, Middletown near Harrisburg there. And you see here an old uh, type, uh, older type thermometer, uh, mercury type thermometer. And then uh, the radar here, we've uh, ours is uh, up just north of the office, up north of State College uh, and our electronics technicians. They spent a lot of time uh, putting software upgrades into that, keeping it up and running. And uh, if it does go down, they're right on it to make sure that you know, the radar's up and functioning and monitoring uh, as it should be 24 7. If it's only four miles, then they up the two. You know, so it's telling you that, well, with 3,000, that doesn't make sense that it's four miles. And then a couple other uh, examples here. Not something we directly or any of our technicians uh, work on in our office, but satellites, of course, uh, got polar and uh, geostationary orbiting satellites up in space. Uh, giving us depictions of uh, cloud cover. Uh, this time of year, we can see snow really well on the visible type channels of that. Uh, so those are always uh, working to remotely sense the atmosphere, just like radar is. And then an example closer to home, uh, what a typical weather service office looks like in terms of all the equipment and the cabinetry, uh, housing, or what we call our AWIP system, Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System. So that's where we go in. Uh, look at all the weather data, issue watches and warnings on, uh, produce the forecast on. And uh, you see these tile floors here. Uh, just a little fun fact, there's a lot of wires in that. These are all pull up. Uh, so a lot of wires in that running throughout the electronics rooms. Uh, they're kept really cool uh, throughout the year just with all the computer uh, systems and electrical equipment in there. So uh, of course, without saying the electronics technicians spend a good deal of time in there making sure things are up, uh, up and functioning as they should be. And I believe uh, I'm going to give it over to Connor here to talk yeah. about some of our local uh, products and services uh, that we do in State College, as well as many weather service offices do around the country. Thank you, Goose. Uh, yeah, so going to just go over some of the, the forecast products that you might see here um, as part of the uh, State College County warning area. Okay, um, so here you'll see the the three basic categories of um, of hazard messaging that you might get uh, from from any sort of National Weather Service office, including here at State College. Um, also, I want to apologize. I I do not have webcam and a working webcam at at this moment, uh, but fortunately, I do have working microphone. Uh, so in the longer term, uh, you have outlooks, which are issued uh, oftentimes several days in advance. So if we want to use uh, the, the example of perhaps a thunderstorm outbreak in the warm season, um, say we're looking at something for Thursday or Friday, uh, you, you might get a, a hazardous weather outlook Monday or Tuesday just to say, hey, keep this on the back burner, that uh, in a few days there's the, there's the potential for, for some severe weather. Keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, when we're starting to look closer to the event, um, in the event of severe weather, say maybe the, the morning or early afternoon of the event, that's when we're starting to look in watch territory. Of um, The ingredients are here, the setup is there, uh, the, the storm, if you will, is, is not yet imminent, uh, but there's definitely the potential for something later on 
be aware, make the preparations that you need to perhaps uh, structure your, your travel plans accordingly, um, looking like there, there's definitely the potential for some hazardous weather uh, later in the day. And then a, a warning is when, um, when, you need to, when you need to take action. In the event of a severe thunderstorm or a tornado, that's where you need to take cover, seek shelter, go to a, a low level of your house um, in a, for a winter, a winter setting, perhaps like a, a winter storm warning, like we're very familiar with lately. Um, that's the idea of make your travel plans accordingly, um, have the have the shovel ready, uh, th those sorts of things. That uh, the hazardous weather is imminent; it will uh, is likely going to be occurring or is currently occurring. And uh, again, uh, back to the thunderstorm example, something that we will actually be start talking about over the next couple months as we uh, go into severe storm season. Um, the the Storm Prediction Center, located in Norman, Oklahoma, provides these uh, thunderstorm risk categories uh, every day and multiple times uh, a day that they're updating. Um, for that is helpful for all weather forecast offices throughout the United States. Uh, and what they do, they take a look at the broad setup of uh, of the atmosphere for each day, and they go out a couple days too in in advance. Uh, to give you an idea of what the risk is and they send that messaging uh, it's available publicly on the SPC website but they also send that messaging to uh, individual weather forecast offices um, to then make decisions that they need to regarding uh, watches and warnings and so forth uh, as well as messaging so briefly going over this um, here we have in the the light green here you, you'll see this message if um, there's there's a risk of some storms, but uh, no, nothing in the line of hail or strong wind expected. Uh, still important to note uh, some of the biggest dangers as far as severe weather that uh, National Weather Service does not offer direct um, warnings for: lightning and flooding. Lightning, uh, lightning and rainfall, they are not criteria in severe, uh, at least in severe thunderstorm warnings. Uh, so very important to remember that even if there's no severe weather outlook uh, for that day. Um, thunderstorms can still bring the danger of lightning and flooding. Uh, when you start starting to look into the marginal and slight, those are the, the two most common risk categories that you see here in the um, Northeast and in the Atlantic US. Um, that's where you're starting to see a, a slight risk that maybe you'll have um, a, a slight severe weather outbreak, maybe some scattered severe storms throughout the day, um, generally very localized uh, in, in nature. When you're starting to go into the enhanced section, um, starting to get a little more rare for this area, which you start to see more commonly in, in the uh, Midwest and Great Plains of the United States, but still will happen um, sometimes a, a couple times a year here in central Pennsylvania. That's when you're starting to look at the, the potential for a widespread, more widespread uh, severe weather outbreak, um, greater risk for perhaps damaging hail, uh, strong winds or straight line winds, uh, and occasionally, depending on the setup, um, the potential for, for a couple tornadoes. When you're starting to look at moderate and high, these two categories are, are rare um, nationwide, uh, typically, but particularly for, for central Pennsylvania. That's when you're really starting to see um, a, a high risk for, for a severe weather outbreak, potentially for a tornado outbreak or very damaging hail event. Um, and the, the each weather, service, weather forecast office and the Storm Prediction Center, they use these categories uh, to make decisions about do we issue a watch um, and, and uh, hazardous weather outlook if we're looking a couple days in advance. But they're also helpful for, for the public just to keep an, keep an eye out too for what to expect for today and in the next couple of days. Moving forward. <laughs> There we go. Okay, um, so here's an example of, of a map view of uh, a, a severe thunderstorm risk. This is from last summer. So you can see here, this is uh, the central Pennsylvania, uh, the State College weather forecast area. And you can see the entire, pretty much the entire state of Pennsylvania and all of our county warning office is at least in a slight risk of severe thunderstorms. Most of it um, stretching from here in the in the Pennsylvania wilds down to the Lancaster and, and Capital Region uh, is in an enhanced risk for severe thunderstorms. And that's when we're, again, looking at the, the potential for some more widespread severe weather. In this case, you can see on the right hand side, this is um, verification, if you will, the, uh, the, the day after the severe storm reports, this is largely a wind event 
for, for Pennsylvania, not much in the line of tornadoes or hail. Uh, wind, wind reports, high wind was the, the main danger here. Um, and you'll see this, the Storm Prediction Center will issue these maps uh, for the, the days preceding a severe weather outbreak. Every day they're issued. Sometimes if there isn't a, a severe weather event in the country, you won't see anything. Um, but days like uh, like this one, June last year, you'll see the map populate with uh, severe storm reports and where they were located. So here in Pennsylvania, in, in central PA, um, the storm actually verified right in that area that was uh, listed as in the enhanced risk for severe storms. And you can see that swath stretching from um, somewhere around Clarion, Jefferson County, all the way down into the, the um, Philadelphia metro area. Uh, a lot of, lot of wind outbreaks or uh, um, wind, wind damage reported there. Uh, another risk product that I um, want to talk about in addition to severe storms is excessive rainfall. And these are uh, first given by the Weather Prediction Center, and that's located in the, the DC metro area. Um, this is what we use for, for flooding, particularly for flash flooding. Uh, and and the, the concept is very similar to uh, what we're talking about with severe storms. Um, not as many categories, but still very similar concept in the sense of uh, you have your marginal and your slight risk, uh, which typically uh, mean more localized flash flooding is possible. Uh, definitely want to keep that in mind for, for when you're traveling, but uh, not looking at any sort of widespread flash flooding. Oftentimes, especially, you know, if you're looking at slight, um, thinking about vulnerable areas, like are you in a flood zone? Um, are you located near a, a stream or, or a river? Um, also, potentially for if you're, if you're um, driving down a road that, you know, there's the potential for, for um, water to, to spill over uh, to keep that in mind for when you're traveling when you're starting to look again to the moderate and to the high that's when you're looking at a more widespread flash flood event um and where you could see uh, not just in like the flood zones the typical spots you know uh, in your town or county you may know of particular roads that may be more prone to to flooding during high rain events uh, when you're starting to get into the moderate and high you're looking at um, an amount of rainfall that's expected or um, a, a short duration of rainfall. It's going to accumulate very quickly um, to the extent that uh, flooding, flash flooding could occur in places that aren't normally prone to flash flooding. So that's when you really want to be aware. I definitely want to uh, make travel plans accordingly. I want to give an example. I'll play this video for you to see too. This is from August of 2018. This was a, a, a rather historic um, flood, flood event for Pennsylvania. You can see here, this was in the um, close to, to high, uh, a, a strong risk of flash flooding. It's issued for everywhere from uh, south of Binghamton, New York, down to around Lancaster County, and wound up being some very severe flooding occurring in Lancaster, York, Lebanon area. Um, as you can see through through this video, uh, my story with this was this hap uh, this occurred about uh, a week or two after I got married, and um, all of our wedding gifts were located in uh, our my uh, in law's basement, and I woke up in the middle of the night to uh, about six inches of water in the basement, and all the gifts were floating. Fortunately, there was no damage to any of them. Um, but it was quite quite the shock to wake up to six inches of, of water with all the gifts uh, floating there. And a lot of people, you know, you had issues with um, farmers with their crops and their, their fields flooding. Um, a lot of people, their basements flooding. So when you start to see that the red risk, the red and the and the pink too, that's when you really need to to be conscious of um, potential issues with low levels of your house be, being prone to uh, to flooding and so forth. Um, definitely a, a risk that we want to be aware of, even if it doesn't happen every year, um, there, there's always that potential. So you always want to keep in mind too, the, the risk for flash flooding, especially because it can come on so quickly. Trying to move forward, sorry. Here we go. Yeah, so some other outlooks uh, that are associated with uh, the weather service. Uh, there's something called uh, river forecast centers and there aren't as many as there are weather forecast offices with the national weather service um if i recall correctly there's somewhere around a dozen or 15 um river forecast centers they're more regional 
And oddly enough, the Middle Atlantic River Forecast Center, which covers, uh, you can see here, parts of New York stretching down to central Virginia, it's actually located in State College. Um, there's a, 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 they share actually office space with the, or the same office building as the State College Weather Forecast Office. And what they do over at the, the River Forecast Center, uh, as the name would imply, they take a look at river readings, they offer um, river and, and stream forecasts and look at uh, the, the risk for you know uh, rivers and streams flooding over their banks and so forth. Uh, and they'll offer outlooks as well. Um, their, their zones, as opposed to being county-based like ours, their zones are based more on river basins. So the Susquehanna, Del, uh, Delaware, down towards the Potomac, and I believe down to the, the James or Rappahannock, I'm trying to remember which one down in, down in Virginia, but here in the Susquehanna River Basin, um, they'll give outlooks for local streams, like maybe say the, the Juniata River, um, going down to Swatara Creek in the, the Lebanon, Harrisburg area, so forth, um, just to give an idea of, okay, maybe over the next couple of days, we're looking at the potential for minor to major flood stage at particular locations. Uh, also, we have winter storm outlooks, uh, just to keep in mind and give you a, a more spatial perspective of where we might be expecting winter storms throughout the country. Uh, and additionally, uh, seasonal drought outlooks. This is very important for, for agriculture, but also for other, other uses, um, including homeowners who are, who are uh, curious about the, the condition of perhaps their gardens or their lawns. Um, in fact, a, a lot of homeowners had, um, it, myself included, had issues with um, keeping their, their, their uh, grass green this past summer because we had a, a considerable drought, um, lack of rainfall throughout part of the, the midsummer. Um, so th these are just some of the other Outlook products that are offered through uh, through the National Weather Service and associated offices. So I want to talk a little bit about the hazardous weather outlook. You won't always see this, uh, you know, if you turn on turn on the the nightly news or the the Weather Channel, uh, but you will see this oftentimes if you sign into um, weather.gov. You might see the screen of um, the county forecast area. And oftentimes you'll see this, this kind of beige color over particular counties if there is a hazardous weather outlook, uh, which could be anything from, as we talked about with severe weather, you know, uh, two, three days in advance of, hey, keep in mind there's a potential for severe weather in, in three days. Um, oftentimes in late summer, in the fall, you'll see a lot of these outlooks out for, um, for our Ridge and Valley counties and um, Allegheny Plateau counties. Um, due to the, the potential for fog, which can be a, a real hazard if you live in, in one of those valley bases, as you can have a lot of fog in the morning time uh, in, in the early fall. Um, so it's, it's all encompassing in the sense that it can be used for, to, to um, call for severe weather, for winter weather events, for heavy rainfall, pretty much anything um, can be given a hazardous weather outlook. The idea is just to, to keep everybody's um, keep it on everybody's back burner a few days in advance. Also important for sectors such as PennDOT, um, emergency management, so forth. You just want to have an idea uh, a few days in advance of what to expect and what potential hazards uh, are forecasted. So I want to talk a little bit too about the difference between a watch and a warning. And uh, I love this little this little graphic here because I think it is a perfect metaphor for, for the difference between the two. It can be a little bit confusing if you know, you see, okay, we have a severe thunderstorm watch. What's the difference between that and a warning? So the watch basically means we have all the ingredients in place. We have, you know, we have our, bar, our, our butter, we have our flour, our sugar. Um, we have all the ingredients in place. So with a, a severe thunderstorm event, that might be, okay, we have a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. We're going to have a lot of sunshine in the day. And there's a cold front coming through later on in the afternoon. There's a lot of, there are a lot of ingredients in place that will be conducive to severe weather. Uh, the warning here, the cupcake warning, is all the ingredients have been mixed and put together. Now you have your cupcake. So uh, in the case of severe storms, um, the, the severe storm warning will be when the cold front comes through and triggers uh, you know, atmospheric motions and, and sets up thunderstorms. That's when we issue the severe thunderstorm warning, when, when the thunderstorms are actually present, when the ingredients have been mixed, uh, so to speak. So I just love this, this little uh, analogy here because it works really well. And watches can be used for not just for severe storms, like in the, the summertime, but also for floods, back to the WPC excessive rainfall outlooks, um, if we're expecting a, a large amount of 
of rainfall, particularly in a short amount of time. Uh, flood watches may be used. Uh, high wind watch for for high wind events. Uh, winter winter storm watches, uh, and then heat and and wind chill watches will also be issued as well. Um, and they're they're used for when there's at least a 50% confidence uh, in advance of uh, potential life threatening or, or high impact weather. So there is there's a there's a metric to it too. And then warnings, that's uh, back to what we were talking about earlier. That's when the, the life-threatening weather is, is imminent. Um, and by imminent, the, the probability exceeds 70 to 80%. So uh, there are both short-fused and long-fused examples of warnings. So uh, short-fused be like a, a tornado warning um, in the sense of it's coming pretty quickly. Oftentimes, a, a warning may come you know, with a half hour or so, uh, or, or maybe even less notice, depending on how quack, quickly the, the, the storm is moving, uh, but also the, the threat will be over very quickly as well. Snow squall warnings too, that's a very new product um, to, to the weather service. And um, for, for lack of a better analogy, it's, it's sort of like an equivalent to, to a severe thunderstorm warning for, for the winter in the sense of it's not severe weather that we're looking at, but it's high impact, quick, uh, quick moving and um, very heavy snow that might be moving in a band, uh, might be moving quickly, but can have uh, cause major travel disruptions. Uh, it's particularly important for, for motorists, um, folks driving down the interstate and so forth. Um, you know, if you've ever been driving down the turnpike or particularly I-80 uh, and, and run into one of these snow bands, you know, it can be quite treacherous. Um, and so the idea here is to give some messaging, um, during, particularly during the daytime hours, for hey, watch out between exits uh, blank and blank, uh, we're seeing a snow squall here, could reduce visibility and could have snowfall rates of an inch per hour, just to give motorists an idea of what to expect and potentially to delay or um, try and find alternative travel arrangements. As far as the, the long fuse, the longer term warnings, uh, a winter storm warning is a, is a great example of this um, in the sense that uh, a winter sto uh, snowfall may occur over a 12 to 24 hour period of time. Uh, river flooding is another one too. Uh, can can be multiple days uh, a span there. Um, heat events and, and wind chill, you know, extreme cold events too. That might be a, a two to three days or more at a time. Um, those are some examples of the the more long term uses of a warning. And so just to give you some kind of spatial overview of the the outlook versus watch versus warning. So here we are. We're looking at Pennsylvania. Um, State College is somewhere around here. Here's Harrisburg. Um, so let's say we're, you know, a couple days out from a potential thunderstorm, a severe severe weather outbreak. Uh, an out, a hazardous weather outlook might be issued, say, for for the area that's expected to see severe weather. So in this case, central Pennsylvania and then parts of northern Virginia, eastern West Virginia. Um, you'll be under, if, if you go into the weather.gov slash CTP, the Central Pennsylvania site, you might see your county covered in gray, or in that in that kind of beigey color um, with a hazardous weather outlook product uh, attached to it saying, hey, keep in mind in a couple days, uh, there's, there's the potential to see some severe weather. And let's say, um, you know, the morning of or, or around noon that day, uh, meteorologists at uh, Weather Forecast Office State College see all the ingredients lining up and feel um, confident enough to in the in the potential for severe weather to issue a watch uh, they'll find a particular region that's a that's of the highest risk in this case uh, south central pennsylvania so cumberland county dauphin county uh, down towards franklin and adams county by gettysburg um, that, that might be the area that they'll issue the watch to say prepare within the next few hours there's uh, there's a high potential for severe weather keep that in mind and then, say, you know, mid-afternoon and the thunderstorms start to break out, that's when warnings will be issued. So um, in this case, these polygons that kind of stretch out from the direction, uh, in, the mo in the direction of motion of the storm. Um, in this example, the, the storm would be located right where my cursor is at the, the short end of this polygon. And um, it's kind of, in a sense, similar if you've ever seen the, the cone of uncertainty issued by the National Hurricane Center, that kind of broadens out um, with, with time just to give a scope of the potential directions of, of movement of the storm. Uh, so basically saying, if you're within this zone, um, 
you are at, you are at high risk for whatever um, product this might be, whether it's a, a tornado warning or a severe thunderstorm warning. Uh, and so that's where we're talking about imminent. The storm is here. Um, take action. Prepare in severe weather. You know, find the lowest level of your house or try to stay off the roads. Um, so that just gives you like a spatial overview of, of what those products mean. Criteria for severe thunderstorms. Um, like I said, lightning and rainfall are not taken into account for severe thunderstorms. Rainfall, oftentimes, um, if appropriate, uh, is more accounted through through a flood watch. Um, and lightning, there are no specific products for that, although that is um, an implied danger with with any sort of severe weather. So um, a severe thunderstorm is defined by either having an inch or plus diameter hail or 58 mile per hour or greater wind gusts. Uh, if there's a tornado associated with the storm, the, the um, storm is automatically upgraded, if you will, to a tornado warning. So it's still technically a severe thunderstorm, but uh, it's much more important for the public to know the tornado risk than the severe thunderstorm element uh, of the, or the hail or wind element of the storm. So hail, high winds or tornadoes are the three criteria for a severe thunderstorm. <laughs> Here's an example of, uh, of an imminent tornado warning. This was uh, from a couple of years back. This is in Columbia County in the upper Susquehanna Valley. Um, you can see here, this is where the tornado warned storm is located in, in these dark reds. Um, and the tornado warning polygon is all this area here. Um, so basically anyone from this corner to this corner uh, in this zone should, should take preparations, um, get to the lowest level of their house, um, because you know if the storm might be heading in a track here, um, we still set up this zone here just for everybody to keep in mind that the storm is uh, an imminent danger and it's going to be regional uh, near to where you're at. So still a good idea to to take cover just in case you know you have a, a tweak a, a, a mile or two in in either direction of the storm's motion. That way you are taking adequate precautions. Um, when the text product is associated, it'll say, okay, for whatever county or the, the portions of the county or counties that the warning is issued for, gives you a time constraint. So this warning was issued at 3.28 in the afternoon, uh, and it's active until 4.15 p.m. Uh, these warnings can sometimes be continued. So let's say in, in the case of the storm, it continued west. I can't remember the specifics of, of this particular storm, but uh, if it continued west and after another half hour, forecasters deemed that it was still a, a tornado risk, they might continue the tornado warning, but instead uh, apply it to the appropriate counties here, uh, Luzerne, Luzerne, Carbon, Schuylkill County there. Um, if, however, um, after a period of time, they deem that the tornado risk is uh, no longer, either the storm is dissipated or by analyzing radar data, uh, that there's no longer the risk for tornado, they may expire the tornado warning. Uh, and so there are two sources, at least for tornadoes, um, for issuing those warnings. One would be through through a spotter. Um, so if a, if a weather spotter calls in and says, uh, hey, we have a, a confirmed tornado on the ground, uh, that's that's one source that could lead to a tornado warning. Oftentimes, the, the second one is what you'll see is radar indicated rotation. So um, analysis, the, the mesoanalysts at Weather Forecast Office State College uh, will take a, a close look at uh, not just um, the radar that we see here, but some uh, very detailed radar products that can indicate if there's the rotation that's indicative of, of a tornado on the ground. Um, the impact, there would be just like a quick section about the, the impact, obviously, with a tornado. It's debris, flying, um, damaging winds, and so forth. And also gives you an idea of uh, when and where you can expect the storm to be. So in this case, you know, Riverside and Mooresburg by 350. Ten minutes later, folks in Danville uh, might be the ones in danger. Um, and then lastly, uh, with, with say a tornado warning, also with snow squall warning, um, it'll give, if, if it's covering like a, a major highway such as an interstate, it'll give you an idea of the mile markers the, that, that motorists need to be aware of for this particular storm. All right, here's uh, an example that we're all familiar with this winter. Um, some winter products here. This on the left is a deterministic snowfall forecast. So there are two types of snow of uh, snowfall forecast. They fall into either deterministic or probabilistic. Deterministic is basically um, saying, okay, we expect for State College, we expect 18 to 24 uh, inches of snowfall, and a map will be constructed 
Uh, if here's your 18 to, to 24 zone throughout north central PA, um, in the orange, you have your 12 to 18. In the um, more lighter yellow, you're looking at 8 to 12 um, set up in that way. A probabilistic forecast, um, which uh, there's been, been some more experimentation and implementation of probabilistic forecasts, uh, would rather be um, still a map of Pennsylvania, but instead it might be something that the headline at the top might be um, potential for or, or percent chance of exceeding six inches snowfall. And in this case, you know, if you're expecting you know, 20 inches of snow up here, it might be a hundred percent chance indicated of at least six inches of snowfall. Whereas down here in the fringes, say down by Philadelphia, we're in the four to six zone, um, you might have a, a, a 30 or 40 percent chance of exceeding the six inch forecast. And that can be helpful because particularly these winter storms, you can see the, the tight gradients that can set up over a range of 50 miles between where you see 20 inches and maybe where you see five inches of snowfall. Um, and where at the last minute, uh, slight changes to the track can lead to drastically different um, observed snowfall totals. So that's why probabilistic forecasts um, are, be, are being implemented more too, to give folks an idea of uh, the degree of confidence in, in a forecast. Um, and also the potential for movements in, in a projected storm track. And uh, these maps will be associated with a map of uh, warnings, uh, watches, and advisories. So this map was uh, likely within, I'm trying to see the, the date, yeah, as the, as the storm was occurring. You can see that uh, all, any and all watches have been converted to warnings and advisories, meaning that the winter weather risk is imminent. It's no longer um, high potential. It is uh, likely occurring or about to uh, occur. So you can see nearly all of the state is in a winter storm warning with fringe areas uh, listed as, as an advisory, um, basically saying there's still the risk for winter weather. It's just not deemed as life-threatening or as much of a risk to, to, to life and property. We'll talk more about advisories um, in a moment. Back to flood warnings. So um, they're not all one and the same. There, there are a few different types. So flash flooding, that's the, um, that's the quickest hitting, if you will, uh, or it's the mo most quickly occurring. Um, that can happen if you, know, you have um, a torrential downpour of you know, a, a large amount of rain in like a half hour or an hour or so that quickly causes, you know, maybe some low-lying streets to um, to flow with water, um, so forth. That's why they call it flash flood. It's, it's very quickly occurring. It can be quite the danger because folks may not be prepared or expecting them. Uh, very, very important that in these, in all flooding events, but particularly for, for flash flood events, um, turn around, don't drown. If you don't have to drive, um, stay home. In this case, uh, get to a higher level of, of your of your home versus a, like a tornado or severe storm where you want to get to a low level. With floods, you want to get above ground and as, as high above ground as is safe. Aerial flooding, um, as opposed to flash flooding, which maybe might be for like localized thunderstorms dropping torrential rainfall, aerial flooding might be something that you'll see if um, maybe we have a, a tropical storm event that's uh, dropping you know two or three inches of rainfall throughout uh, much of the county uh, forecast or the, the county warning area um, not necessarily as, as intense or as, as localized as flash flooding uh, but still very much a, a risk to, to creeks to streams um, and uh, can still be be a threat for, for life and property last and certainly not least is river flooding um, it's slowest to develop and the nice thing about this is that uh, gives some some lead time for the folks over at the river forecast centers um, to have an idea of okay within a day or two we're expecting uh, at these locations along the Susquehanna River to be at for example a like major flood stage um, you, you have some good lead time which allows folks um, you know uh, stakeholders whether you're a property owner by the river or um, you have business or you're traveling there to make plans accordingly uh, and to prepare um, and this can be a great danger if you live in, um, say, Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, near near the river. If you live uh, at Harrisburg, along along the Susquehanna River, or um, if you're just in an area that's prone to, to flooding, uh, this is a really important thing to keep in mind, um, as it allows you to, to uh, take some extra time to take appropriate precautions and prepare for the potential for, for river flooding events. Uh, one more thing to talk about is the the wireless emergency alert. So um, this graphic might look a little 
little uh, overwhelming, a little confusing. Uh, in a nutshell, if your if your phone is WEA wireless emergency alert uh, supported, the idea here is um, let's say you are you know you're driving down I-80 and uh, you're going westbound, you're heading the direction of my cursor, and here is a snow squall warning. Um, anybody in first in this polygon, this is the polygon of the snow squall warning, for example. Anybody there is going to get an alert sent to their phone. But additionally, if you're in any of these hexagons, which are defined, um, I think they're like uh, certain kind of mobile towers um, that are that are given over the area. If you're in any of these hexagons, regardless of whether or not you're within the warned area, you're also going to get an alert. Just to give you a, um, some heads up of in this area, there's a dangerous weather occurring. So, for example, if you're up here by the letter A, no, you're not in the snow squall warning, but you're still going to get the buzz on your cell phone just to let you know there's a snow squall warning in the area. Um, some of the idea behind that is, you know, maybe you're not currently in the in the um, direction of the snow squall, but maybe you're heading south and you're about to get on the interstate. Um, might be nice to, you know, have a heads up of, hey, watch out, um, dangerous weather occurring. And so if you don't have emergency alerts uh, supported on your cell phone, highly encourage you to do that. Um, that's a, a great way for, for us to uh, communicate with you all, um, particularly when it comes to uh, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, uh, snow squall warnings, also for, for flash flood events too. Great way to get information uh, to the public as soon as possible. And back to advisories. Uh, so we talked about warnings. Um, so with severe weather, like a severe thunderstorm or a tornado, uh, there are no advisories. You either have the, um, the tornado or you don't, but you see these a lot of the times in the winter. Um, so for instance, um, it's about a, a week or so ago, we had a winter weather event throughout um, the, the forecast area. And in the Southern and uh, Southeastern portion of the State College Weather Forecast Office, um, the forecast, the snowfall forecast was high enough such that it met warning criteria. So areas like Lancaster, York County, um, I think maybe Dauphin County, if I recall correctly, uh, were put under a winter weather or winter storm warning, given the amount of snowfall that was expected. However, up in the, the central and more northern parts of the area, such as Mifflin County, Center County, um, I think maybe uh, Snyder and Union counties, they were listed under a winter weather advisory. Not to say, you know, there's not going to be any snow at all, but to say that uh, the, the risk to life and property is deemed slightly lower than the areas south. And the criteria for winter weather, winter storm warnings and advisories also uh, can vary by location. So for instance, um, up in northern Maine, the amount of snow required for uh, a warning will be much higher than say in South Carolina where um, you know two three inches of snow can can be quite hazardous um, and and not as common whereas um, in northern locations of the country uh, it's much more common and uh, the resources are, are available to better respond to those to those events more quickly so even in our area uh, northern counties have a slightly higher um, threshold for for snowfall for advisories versus warnings uh, compared to areas along the southern tier near the Maryland line. So that's something to keep in mind. That's not to say there's no risk at all. Uh, it's still just to keep in mind, uh, even though there's a lower risk to, to life and property, um, still could be some nuisance type weather, want to take it easy out on the roads, uh, take travel precautions. Um, another thing to keep in mind too is uh, heat and uh, extreme cold, so wind chill advisories. Um, if it's not going to be uh, as hot as to issue a, a excessive heat warning might still issue a heat advisory if it's still um, within a within a high enough range there. So it's basically just like a, um, a light version of, of the warning. I'm going to pass it over to, I believe, Miranda. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I think I've got it. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the program areas at NWS State College. If I can change the slide. Okay, so um, one of the most important and popular things that forecast offices do is obviously the routine forecast. This is the seven day forecast using a lot of different tools. So that includes model data, satellite, radar, um, individual weather stations, 
And what forecasters do is they take in all of this information as well as their meteorology degrees, all that skill, and they use it to create a forecast. And there are a variety of ways that this forecast gets out. Um, there's both text and graphical format for people of different preferences. And that's also posted a lot of different places. So the main way to get to it is obviously weather.gov slash CTP for the state college seven day forecast. But also sometimes if there's interesting weather or particularly hazardous weather happening, it'll also get posted on social media to give people a heads up. Um, NWS State College has a Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And um, forecasts are also given out through NOAA weather radio, as well as phone recordings. You can actually call your forecast office and get um, a recording for your area for the forecast if you prefer it that way. So this is the forecast and weather monitoring interface. On the top right, you'll see that's a graphical forecast editor or GFE. And that's basically a program that forecasters use to edit individual grid cells with the forecast for that particular location. On the bottom left, that's called AWIPS. Uh, Jonathan was talking about that earlier, but that's the interface that most of the products and data come in through. That's where you'll get your satellite, your models, your radar. And then the picture on the bottom right, that's a forecaster doing his job. So on the right, it looks like he has graphical forecast editor and AWIPS up. He's going to use those to create the forecasts. And then on the Windows computers on the left, that's where it actually goes out to the public. So this is our website, weather.gov slash CTP. That's kind of the home base for everything state college weather related. So when you pull up that site, you'll get something that looks like the picture on the left that'll tell you any current watches, warnings, or advisories that are currently in effect in the county warning, county warning area. So you'll see that in the picture, you can actually click on your specific location and that'll take you to something that looks like the picture on the right with a much more detailed hourly forecast. It'll give you a lot more information that is specific to your area. So this is a good tool to know how to get to. We also have the new and improved radar.weather.gov. This has a lot of cool features. You can turn on dual pole radar, which is new, I think. And also you can overlay various layers of data on the map, depending on what you're trying to look at. You also have the option to just look at one specific radar, or you can overlay a whole bunch of radars to see what the big picture is. And like the website I just showed you, you can also click on your specific location to get more localized data for your area. So there are also river forecasts. Connor was talking about this a little bit earlier. These are not actually done by the WFO or Weather Forecast Office, but by the River Forecast Center or RFC. And like he mentioned, our RFC is co-located with the Weather Forecast Office. That makes things really easy. They are the ones that go in and make the river forecasts, and then they send it over to the WFO to be issued. So on the left, you'll see all those green dots. You can click on any of those to get a hydrograph, which is like the thing on the right. That's a graphical view of the river forecast. It'll tell you what the river levels are expected to look like. And that'll also give you any important information about things like river flooding. So in addition to all of those services, State College also issues aviation forecasts for seven airports in central PA. These are very detailed 24 hour forecasts. They tell information about cloud bases, winds, and anything that would be of particular concern to aviation, like fog, rain, and haze. And these are received at the airports and they're used to make decisions about whether or not for um, flights need to be canceled or delayed based on any dangerous weather in the area. And these are also used to support national air traffic flow in coordination with the aviation weather centers and the center weather service units. On the bottom right there, you'll see that's a terminal aviation forecast or a TAF. These are written in code, but everyone who is receiving these knows how to read them. It's actually quite simple if you just look up on the internet what the different letters and codes mean, but they use these to you know, make decisions about aviation that can be really important.
So here's just um, all of the locations of the airports in central PA that get these TAFs. Um, each one comes with a variety of challenges and has to be made individually because there are a lot of different factors influencing the weather at each location, various terrain challenges. Some of them are at different elevations. So each one comes with a variety of challenges. There are also fire weather forecasts. These are issued three times a day. And these are very detailed. They give you information about things like temperature, winds, and humidity, anything that would impact the particular fire risk for that day. Um, these are used by people for um, emergency management operations, as well as search and rescue, and also just by private citizens for determining things like whether or not it's safe for a prescribed burn, or if it's a kind of risky fire weather day, maybe you don't want to have a bonfire, things like that. But again, these are very detailed, and there's an example of one on the right that's in text format. But if you don't like text format, there's also graphical format, as you see here. So the ones on the bottom, those are showing you things like minimum relative humidity, max sustained winds, and max wind gusts. Because when you get a certain combination of factors, say it's very dry, and it's also very windy, that really ups the chances of a wildfire initiating or at least makes you know that you don't want to do anything with fire that day because it could easily spread. So to access these products, you can either go to weather.gov slash ctp slash briefing and click on the fire and drought tab, or to go straight there, you just go to weather.gov slash ctp slash fire weather. And you can also do this for other offices if you're interested in their particular fire weather forecasts. There's also air quality reports. I feel like people don't really know that these are out there, but they are at your disposal. These are issued every day at 3.30 p.m. They're made in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And these are useful, especially for people who are members of at-risk groups, the elderly, or for example, people with asthma. It tells them if it's safe to do certain activities outdoors that day. For example, you know, if it's a really bad air quality day, maybe you don't want to go on a run, things like that. And like most forecasts, these are issued in both text and graphical format. An example of the text is on the right. But if you're interested in the graphical, Trying to change slides. There we go. Oh, too far. Okay, so this is the map of the whole US. So the at the federal level, I think these are done by the EPA. So this can give you an idea of how the air quality is all across the country, it tells you areas where there's bad or good air quality, um, might give you ideas of places you might want to avoid. This is also really interesting during forest fires, especially out west, because you'll just see like huge areas of very poor air quality related to the smoke and the particulate matter. And also these air quality forecasts are mostly dependent on things like particulates, like I said, and smoke, as well as um, tropospheric ozone. So as you may know, we want ozone in the stratosphere that protects us from harmful UV rays. But when ozone is present in the troposphere or the lowest layer of the atmosphere, it's taking the form of smog, and that's actually quite harmful sometimes. Then we have NOAA weather radio. This is a continuous broadcast of forecasts and warning information, covers most of the country. And this is also what activates the emergency alerting that Connor was talking about earlier. So if you've ever been watching TV and you hear that beeping and suddenly you know, you're in a tornado warning, that's activated by NOAA weather radio. So this is just another way that NOAA sends out weather information. As you've seen, there are many different ways to access and you can find things anywhere online. You can go on radio, you can go on the phone. There's always a way to find it. So of the public facing program areas at NWS offices, they kind of fall into three main categories. First, there's the decision support services. This is providing weather information, both remote and on site for decision makers or emergency managers. 
A good example of this is that NWS State College does individual forecasts for the Little League World Series every year. So this is a very specific and local forecast for that particular event. And it tells them whether it's safe to keep playing or, you know, for example, if there's lightning in the area, maybe they need to postpone a game and get everyone inside to make sure everyone's safe. Next is the public service desk. This is the person in the forecast office who's answering the phones and you know answering questions from the general public. They're the ones running the social media and doing interviews with reporters. They're also responsible for quality control of data and product. And going off of that, there's the Cooperative Observing Program. So the National Weather Service actually has a network of trained observers who take weather information sometimes in their own backyards and they send this information in one way or another to their local forecast office where it is then quality controlled by the public service desk usually and if everything looks good that information gets put in the long-term climate record this is a really important record to have it's got a lot of applications and research and for example, um, for things like climate change, it's good to know what the long-term climate record is so that you can have that baseline to compare any like nuance changes to. Oops, sorry, I think we're turning it over to Rachel now. All righty. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, everyone, so far who's presented. Um, thank you, everyone who stuck around till 8 p.m. to listen to us talk. We're almost done. I promise I'm going to kind of go a little speedy through this. And then if we have any questions at the end, of course, we can go back and uh, make sure everyone has their questions answered. So I'm going to be telling you where to find online products in addition to all the other online products that we've seen before and how to use them and where to find the most relevant information for you. So the first thing is maybe the most important, the new briefing page. So weather.gov slash CTP slash briefing. This is basically a one-stop shop for all of the weather information you could possibly hope and need to get. Um, if you go to this briefing page, this is what it's gonna look like. You're gonna see a link to the latest weather briefing. This is issued when we issue weather briefings for our partners, so emergency managers and the like. If they need to know about significant weather that's coming our way, or maybe we're in the middle of a hazardous weather event and we're providing updates. If you click on this, it'll take you to the current briefing that's in effect. Maybe it's about severe weather, maybe it's about winter storms, maybe it's about flooding. Whatever it is, it'll provide you with a lot of information. That's also useful for our core partners. And if there's no briefing in effect, like right now, you'll go to it and say there's no briefing. So that's a really good thing to do if you just want to look at our briefings and look at what we're putting out. And you're also greeted with a bunch of these tabs. So there's a hazardous weather outlook, current weather, rainfall, thunderstorms, winter weather, temperatures and wind, drought and fire weather, tropics, so anything uh, tropical like hurricane season that might be affecting us, long range forecasts, weather information by county, and then forecast tools. So everything that you could possibly want is in here, just have to figure out what works best for you. So right now, hazardous weather outlook is, is pulled up. It's gonna tell us where there's a hazardous weather outlook, what it is, who's affected, do we need the spotters activated, et cetera, et cetera. You can also go through the different versions, read that. This is a really great way to learn about weather stuff if you're just a weather enthusiast. Um, so go ahead, go in here and play. And of course, if you have any feedback, you're welcome to send us an email and tell us, hey, I think it'd be really great if we added a tab like this, or where can I find this information? Maybe you should add it to this web page because this is under construction still. And it, you know, if you need something that we're not providing, let us know and we can we can get it added in there. All right, so the next thing is county level forecast. And this is going to be accessed by weather.gov slash ctp slash dss. When you go there, you'll be greeted with this page. Now it's a whole map of Pennsylvania. And if you're in central Pennsylvania, you're in luck because you can click this map and go to your specific county. If you're in any of the surrounding counties, I'm sorry, but this is not the page for you because this is just for CTP or this yellow area here. And if you want, you can either select the county with this drop down menu or you can click on this map too. So, um, you know, say I'm in Center County, I'm in State College, I want to know what the forecast is for the entire county. 
you know, I've got countywide information that I need to have. And it will pull up an hour by hour forecast for that day. Now, this is not a long range forecast, this is short term, just for about those 24 hours or 12 hours that you care about short term. And hour by hour, it's gonna tell you the information. So temperature, wind chill, wind speed, wind direction, gusts, chance of precipitation, and any significant weather that's going on. If it's all green, there's no threats. So green is no threats. And then of course, threat level increases. Uh, yellow meaning there's limited threats, orange meaning elevated, uh, red significant, and then of course purple is extreme. So that would be a very bad dangerous weather situation. And um, maybe you don't wanna be outside doing whatever county exercise you're doing that day. So for this particular day on Monday at 4 p.m., there's a limited threat for wind because it's highlighted yellow here. Um, so that means it's gonna be kind of windy. Not too crazy though, because we're not getting into the orange or reds, but you know, you might wanna be aware of this. If you have some tents or umbrellas outside, you know, they might get a little bit tossed and turned around with the wind. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, if you're a visual learner, then looking at this is really easy because your eyes are automatically drawn to what's the most important thing? What time is it happening and what is it? You know, is it wind, is it temperature? Um, are we in a heat advisory? Is that gonna be the main threat today? Is there gonna be a thunderstorm? You know, at what time potentially are we gonna see that? So this is really important. Definitely keep your eye on this because um, these do change and they're, they're updated. And also if you are an emergency manager uh, for a specific county and these threat levels do not suit your needs, let us know and we can change this for you. Um, we can make sure that these threat levels are focused for what you need them to be and reflect what colors you wanna see on this table. So um, these can be altered based on your needs, but that's only if you're an emergency manager or core partner for the National Weather Service. All right, so this is actually one of your handouts um, for this presentation. So weather awareness links or weather.gov slash CTP slash DSS, you can actually find the weather awareness links page in there. This weather awareness links page lives in a lot of different places in the State College website. So if you can find them all, great. Um, I think it lives in three different areas. And again, this is just a helpful grab and go kind of worksheet um, that you can keep in your binder, you can keep on your desk, wherever you wanna keep it, maybe just somewhere on your computer. First is have a way to receive warnings and alerts. This is the most important thing because if you can't receive thunderstorm warnings or flood warnings or snow squall warnings, then that could be potentially dangerous for you, potentially a bad thing. So what I recommend to everyone is if you have a smartphone, you download the FEMA app, Federal Emergency Management Agency app. And when you do that, you can select what alerts you want and for where. So I live in State College. I wanna know everything that's happening in State College, but I also mentioned I'm from Chicago. So maybe I still have some family members in Chicago that I wanna make sure I'm keeping an eye on the weather for them in case they don't know about a threat that's coming. So I can also say I wanna keep an eye on alert, alert for my family members who live in different places. So it's really customizable to who you wanna keep an eye on and where and what you wanna see. And then when anything happens, you know, the National Weather Service issues a warning or winter weather advisory or anything like that, you'll get an automatic ping on your phone, an update notification, and you'll be alerted about what it is, what time it expires, what time it's in effect, um, how much we're expecting of what, et cetera, et cetera. The next thing is INWS, um, and that is for anyone who's involved in safety decision making. So that not everybody can join INWS. It is kind of reserved to a small crowd of people if you fall within uh, public safety and decision making. This is another way to get warnings alerts sent directly to your phone in the form of a text message, or you can get an email. You can basically kind of choose uh, where you want to get the alerts and for what. If you go to mobile.weather.gov in a browser, um, on your phone, you can see the mobile forecast for forecasts and updates. The National Weather Service does not have an official app, so this is gonna be your best bet for getting the forecast on your phone. And then you can go to radar.weather.gov, which Miranda talked about as the new radar site that we have, and it's of course gonna give you real-time radar updates and data associated with that. Next thing you wanna do is be prepared for different types of weather hazards. So there's a bunch of links in there. Some of them we've already talked about. Um, 
where you can get different types of links. So severe uh, storm prediction center convective outlooks. Connor talked a lot about the storm prediction center and the outlooks associated with uh, severe thunderstorms. If you go there, that's where you can get your outlooks. Um, the excessive rainfall outlook, there's a link there. Um, current watches, warning advisories, you know, for either the entire US or just Pennsylvania. For this link in particular, it's just Pennsylvania. Um, if you want to see hazards and data viewer, if you want to see the Keystone Mesonet, which is just surface observations, current observations right now of what's happening in the world of weather, then you can go there. And then finally, plan ahead by looking at the forecasts. So these uh, we're actually going to talk about in just a sec. Forecast points is a point-specific forecast just for your location. Um, if you're a graphical learner and you like to see the whole state, you can go to grid images underscore PA. Um, you can see uh, loops and time series, and then you can go to the self-briefing page, which we already talked about as CTP slash briefing. So I encourage you to download this, go through all the links, figure out which one's your favorite, um, and then maybe just bookmark them so you don't have to come back to this page all the time. And then you'll have all of the resources that you need right at your fingertips. All right, so forecasts. How do we see a forecast? We already know that we can use the point and click map method that Miranda showed us. Go to weather.gov slash CTP, and then you click on the map and you get a forecast. But maybe you don't want to just have a specific forecast. Maybe you want to look at the entire uh, central Pennsylvania region or the entire Pennsylvania region. And these are going to be found at weather.gov slash CTP slash grid images or grid images underscore PA. Grid images will take you to just central Pennsylvania. Grid images underscore PA will take you to all of Pennsylvania. And this is another one of those cool websites that have not only all the things down the Y axis to choose what you want to see. So temperature, dew point, humidity, all the way to satellite loops. But you can get all the information for different types of weather, like temperatures, wind, precipitation, ice, fire weather, and then radar and satellite, and then any outlooks that are issued that you might want to think about for the next few days. So if you click on any of these tabs, it'll tell you what's happening now, and then it'll give you a forecast for tonight, for the next few days, over the next few hours. So it's really, really helpful to look at. Same thing with underscore PA. Now we're just looking at the whole state. So if you want to look at this, you know, maybe you're planning a trip, you're going up north to Warren from State College and you want to know what it's going to be like for the weekend. And you want to make sure that your bonfire that you're planning for camping would be appropriate to have and that you're not going to start the whole forest on fire. So maybe you go to the fire weather tab and make sure that everything is looking okay for you to have your camping trip in Warren. So this is a really good resource. I encourage you to check it out. Um, it is in that weather awareness links tab and, and document if you're interested. Next is point specific forecasts. So this is going to be found at weather.gov slash forecast points. And when you go to this, it's going to give you an entire map of the entire USA. So this is not just Pennsylvania specific, but of course you can make it Pennsylvania specific. You can also make it whatever you want because it's for the entire US and you can get your specific forecast at a specific point, which is really, really cool. So the first thing you're gonna be greeted with is this map and you're gonna zoom in to wherever you wanna go. And then if you're interested, there are different layers from this little uh, square here, polygon. You can click on this and here we can overlay radar. Over radar is overlaid here. So you can just say, okay, I wanna see the radar. I just wanna know what's happening right now. Show it to me, radar can pop up. So in this current situation, we can see I'm in State College. Snow is coming my way, all right? So that's good to know. And then if I'm interested in my point specific forecast, I'll click and a little white dot will pop down where I clicked. And then it'll tell me the forecast for that exact location. So again, if you're going on a camping trip, you're planning a trip, uh, you live somewhere that's a little bit remote and maybe you want to know exactly for that specific location what your weather is going to be, this is where you would go. And the first thing you're gonna be greeted with is this hourly table. It's going to give you Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera, et cetera, um, and give you hourly updates. So all of the weather that you're interested in, everything per hour. So weather with cute little pictures in here to help draw your eye towards what's going to be happening, you know, sunny later on a Wednesday, Wednesday morning, cloudy until then. And then um, all the information you could have, statistically speaking, for temperature, wind chills, wind speeds, et cetera. Wind direction is shown by arrows. 
And then we even have the information color coded to help, again, draw your eyes to what's happening. So dew point, if it's dry, it's going to be brown. If it's moist, it's going to be green. And then sky cover, if it's gray, then that means there's clouds. And if it's blue, that means there's less clouds. You might see some peaks of sunshine and peaks of blue sky. Um, actually misspoke. The first table that you see is going to be this one. And then if you scroll down, it will be this table that we just talked about. So let me back up here and talk about this table. So when you point that, put that clicker on the map, the first thing you're going to see is this table now. And this is the extended forecast. Now you're going to get it for basically a week, Tuesday through Monday, for this particular example. And then again, this is color coded to draw your eyes, to help you understand it very quickly without having to read all the numbers if you're not interested in sitting and reading numbers. So for example, temperature, blues are kind of cold, greens are a little bit milder, and then if it was hot, you know, we'd get into the oranges, yellows, and reds maybe even too. So this will be something that you see right up front. And then the outlooks, you know, are we expecting severe thunderstorms, excessive rain? And um, if you keep scrolling down, then you'll see this hourly table. And then if you keep scrolling, my favorite part, there are these meteograms. So um, you can see an actual graph per hour of what's going to be happening. So temperatures, uh, precipitation, precip amount, when it's going to happen, and then wind speed, direction, and gusts. So um, this is really helpful for figuring out like at what time can I expect the highest temperatures or the gustiest winds or what time am I going to expect some rain? And these, this is completely customizable too. So if you only care about temperature and wind and you don't care about precipitation, that's not important to you, you can delete, you can go through and edit and take away the option to see this stuff. And you can rearrange it so the most important to you Thing pops up first. So if wind is the most important thing to you, you can customize it so that wind will pop up first. If you save it, it'll always come back to that your, your saved settings. You have to have like cookies enabled and stuff like that. But if you do, every time you open up this page, your settings will be saved and you'll be able to come in and see exactly what you put down as your favorites. So I hope you guys use this tool. I really like it a lot. I especially like the mediograms. It's really helpful for me visually to see what's going on. All right, the next thing is contacting us with reports. The National Weather Service loves storm reports. There's no such thing as too much data. We can take all the data we can get. So if you have a, a, something to report, um, we encourage you to visit, visit weather.gov slash ctp slash report severe. And you can, um, whoops, sorry, let's go back just a second. We can um, submit snowfall reports, we can submit severe weather reports, you can submit reports to ctp.stormreports at noaa.gov, or you can put them on social media. We're monitoring social media all the time, Facebook, Twitter, hashtag PAWX, that'll help us see it right away. Or you can call us directly, 814-954-6440, that's also at the bottom of the page here. Um, and there's a little bit on this page of tips of how to report severe weather or snowfall. Um, we don't want every report. We don't want temperatures necessarily every single day, but if something really, really interesting is happening, like you might see a funnel cloud in your backyard, or you got 10 inches of snow, or you got hail, and we want to know what is happening, what, what about the severe weather is significant, and you have something to show us, please, please, please send us these reports. And of course, send us the time, send us the location, send us a picture if possible. We love to see pictures. It really helps validate our forecasts and warnings. Um, so please, 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 if you have reports, send them to the reports form um, or visit this website, Report Severe, and look at the criteria for reporting stuff. And we would love to see your reports 